Okay. Um, to, um, to finish covering Gauss quadrature, um, I thought what I would do is, uh, show a couple of problems that I had considered assigning for homework and decided not to include them. And I imagine that, uh, after you see these problems worked out, you'll probably be grateful that I did not include them. Um, and uh, having thought through them, it's like, yeah, I think that was the right decision um, for, for all concerned. Um, oh, yeah, and I haven't forgotten that I do have a few submissions of prior homeworks from you all, so I, I'll, I've, I'll try to get to those uh, soon. Um, okay. Um, now, the first, so this is actually a, a pair of problems. Um, I guess I have things a little out of order, but whatever on that. Um, okay. So this is pro these are problems uh, nine, seven, eight, and nine, seven, nine. Okay. Um, so, um, so ordinary Gauss quadrature uses the Legendre polynomials. Uh, I mentioned like the Gauss Legendre points um, because that has a weight function of of one. Uh, so so if, you, so if you're not if you're doing an integral that does not have a weight function at all, you'd be finding orthogonal polynomials for weight function one, and that'd be Legendre on the interval minus one to one. And if it's a different interval, just scale and shift those. That's all you have going there. But what if you do have a weight function? Um, okay, so integral from minus one to one of f, but now we have this weight function um, one minus x squared to the minus one half, um, which it may not be defined at the endpoints, but at least it's defined on the interior of the interval, and it's certainly positive there. So that's a valid uh, weight function. Um, OK. Um, now, um, I just realized that the problem 979 is worded pretty badly. Um, so I want a quadrature rule that has this form. Um, the usual form. And then, because this is the exact integral, and this is only the approximation, um, it should have uh, an error term here. And uh, in the problem 979, I forgot the error part, um, but this would be exact. Um, If uh, f is a polynomial, of degree 2 and minus 1 or less. Um, so the problem, I did state this down below, but I, I didn't make that clear beforehand. So I, now i got to hurry up and fix this in a new edition of a book that's coming out. Dang it. Um, OK. Um, so. Um, so what the problem called for is, um, and this actually be related to one of the homework problems that I did assign, kind of. Um, how can we use, dang it, I can't type. Direct construction to find nodes and weights 
nodes and weights. And give us a degree of accuracy of 2n minus 1. Um, OK. So we need to solve this system of, uh, of equations um, where if I substitute for f of x polynomial starting at degree 0 all the way up to degree 2n minus 1, um, then if I use that to quadrature rule, that's the degree of what I get for the true integral. So the idea is the quadrature rule um, where I use each Chebyshev polynomial evaluated at the nodes and then times the weights must be equal to the exact integral of that same Chebyshev polynomial with the weight function. Whoops, that should be just x. Okay. Um, and this has to be true for k equals 0, 1, 2, up to 2 and minus 1. Now, I can actually tell you what the um, exact value of the integral should be. Um, all right, so when k is 0, it should be equal to pi. And it's equal to 0 otherwise. And this is true for k equals 0, 1, 2, up to 2 and minus 1. OK, so I want to find nodes xi and weights wi so that this sum will be equal to these values, pi for k equals 0 and then equal to 0 otherwise. Because then, if it's exact, for these Chebyshev polynomials up to this degree, then by linearity, the uh, quadrature will be exact for this integral for all polynomials up to this degree. Now, normally when you do direct construction, you don't use the Chebyshev polynomials to use the monomials, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, etc. But in this case, because it's weight function, it's more convenient to use uh, the uh, uh, Chebyshev polynomials. Yeah. All right. Um, now, um, okay. So, so how do we find the nodes and weights? Um, or there's a hint that's given in the problem. Um, Chebyshev polynomials are um, orthogonal on the interval minus 1 to 1 with respect to the weight function that's given here. So 1 minus x squared minus 1 half. Um, so the nodes should be the roots of Tn of x. We want an n node quadrature rule. So the roots of the nth degree Chebyshev polynomial should be the nodes. Um, so that would be xi is equal to, and this is what you dealt with in a uh, homework uh, five, I believe. Wait, no. Homework three, I think. No. Yes, never mind. Okay, so uh, 2i minus 1. Oh, wait. Yeah, i starting at 1. Okay, over 2n times pi. And then I have to take the cosine 
of the whole thing. Okay, and that would be for um, I going from one to n. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, uh, so presumably V should be the nodes, but what about the weights? Uh, we, we don't have any insight about that. Um, but I'm going to digress here and show a different result, which is actually from the other problem, 978, that's going to help us get um, the weights here. I mean, we have a formula for the weights. The weights are the integrals of the Lagrange polynomials with its weight function, but that would be horrific to try to compute. So, no, we are not doing that. Um, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to define theta to be um, okay. Um, right. Equal to uh, pi over two n. So then we have each xi is equal to cosine of uh, 2i minus 1 theta. Okay. All right, so that'll just condense things a little bit. Um, so now I'm going to consider this sum. Uh, cosine theta, which would be for i equals 1, so that's the first node, plus um, Cosine of three theta. Okay. Um, cosine of this. Hmm. Hold on, I need to check something here. This is what I get for doing this kind of winging it. Um, oh, sorry. I goofed a little bit. I want theta to not be pi over 2n. I want it to be k pi over 2n. I actually want to take a look at this expression here. Or something like it. It's here. I'm leaving out the weights. Notice I weights here just the sum of the Chebyshev values. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to fill in the definition of a Chebyshev polynomial. So that'd be a cosine of k inverse cosine of xi. Um, now I fill in what xi is. But xi is a cosine of all this. So now I'm going to have A fraction, okay, so um, 2n minus 1, k pi over 2n. Um, so now, with theta equal to k pi over 2n, um, that's the same as cosine. 2i minus 1 times theta. All right, so that's what I want. 
So it's a sum of cosine of odd multiples of theta. So if I write out what this sum is, term by term, um, I have a cosine theta plus cosine three theta, and so on, all the way up to n terms altogether, 2n minus 1 theta. Okay. And what is this equal to? And this is what exploration 978 is all about. So how do we do this? Um, so what I'm going to do is um, do some trig magic here. I'm going to multiply and divide this expression by um, sine theta. All right, so I'm going to have sine theta for each term. All right, and then I'll just divide by, well, um, So really just multiplying both sides by sine theta. And what we're looking for, the value of this sum, that's going to be the question mark. So I'll just leave that there. Yeah, real rigorous, I know. Um, now, why am I doing this? What I can do with this is use a helpful trig identity. And since I've uh, forgotten what a trig identity is, and I'm too lazy to try to derive it on the spot, don't trust me in front of you all. I'm going to just look it up. Um, okay. You always have to remember that when you're teaching, your IQ plunges. Um, okay. Uh, um, well, actually, I do have it in my head now, but and again, I'm going to play it safe and confirm. Um, so this is what we are going to use here is called a product to sum identity. Um, and if I, I'm on a Wikipedia page for uh, um, trig identities, and so many of them. Okay, so product to sum identity for uh, Cosine times a sine. Okay. Um, okay, so cosine A sine B is equal to one half. Um, and it's a uh, uh, sine A plus B. Um, minus sine a minus b. All right, and it turned out I did remember it right. Um, OK, so, so now I can apply this to each one of these. So cosine times sine, that's going to be equal to, or we're going to have a one half in common. Um, so, so first we're going to have uh, cosine of uh, this plus this, so cosine of uh, two theta. Oh, sorry, sine of two theta. Um, and then sine of theta minus theta, but that's going to be zero. So, um, so if the first term is going to give me only that. Oh, you might know this already is a double angle identity. Uh, what about the next term, though? This one. Well, it's uh, 
Sine of verse sum. So sine of four theta. Minus sine of a difference of these two, but that's sine two theta. I'm going to put this in parentheses so you can see how where everything is coming from. And then I move on to five theta, so I add them. Sine of six theta minus sine of four theta. Okay. Can you see what's happening? Now this is going to simplify a Anyone? How's this going to simplify a lot? Is it just a yes. multiple of sine two theta? Um, well. Won't we have a lot of cancellations? Yeah, what exactly? Like the four sine of four theta is the sine of, like everything but the. Yes. Mm, yeah, these two yeah. cancel. Yeah, and then those cancel. And then, then yeah, that and then, yeah. Only this will remain. Um, this is called a telescoping series. Um, so anytime you have a series, it may have come across this like in, in calculus, um, where when you when you write out the terms of a series in full, that uh, parts of these terms cancel and leave you with practically nothing left. Um, okay, that was redundant. But anyway, um, so yeah, the only thing that's left is this one. It's uh, um, 2 and minus 2, although it's kind of weird that I'm getting... Oh, okay, no, this is supposed to be a plus. Yes, okay. Um, so, um, all right, so now I have uh, one half, um, sine two n theta is equal to question mark, uh, sine theta. Um, and then, um, so ultimately what we have is the original expression, um, is equal to, uh, sine to n theta over uh, two sine theta. Um, provide that theta is not an integer multiple of pi. Um, because in that case, we'd be dividing by zero. Okay, so now let's use this up here, so we have a, a sum 
of what I had before, of a, of a Chebyshev polynomial of degree k. Um, now, that was already known to be equal to, going back up here, this exact sum. Um, so now I can fill in what that is. Um, so that's going to be fraction sine of 2n times theta. Now, if I go back, um, okay, well, I'll just fill in the expression first, 2n theta. All right, so I have that. So now I just need to go back and see what theta is. Theta is equal to k pi over 2n. Um, so if I fill that in, so k pi over 2n times 2n, well, that's sine k pi all over sine of, or sorry, 2 sine k pi over 2n. Okay. Well, I'm taking a sine of that whole thing. And this is for k equals 0, 1, 2, up to 2 and minus 1. OK. <clears throat> um, so now, um, what is this going to be? equal to since k is an integer. Is the test of your trig. <laughs> Would it not Would it depend not? on K being even or odd, too? Uh, or you're thinking of cosine K pi that would influence it, but. but when it's sine K pi, what's sine K pi? When K is even. Just one or negative one. That's cosine of k pi. Oh, so zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other option. <laughs> Y'all flunk trig. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, yeah, it, it's zero unless k is zero, because then we have zero over zero. But if um, <clears throat> when k is equal to zero, but Chebyshev polynomial is just one. So all we have here is okay. So I can do a piecewise statement. All right. So it is equal to uh, so when um, k is equal to zero, but Chebyshev polynomial is just one. So it's just going to be equal to n when k is equal to zero. And it's equal to uh, zero otherwise. OK. So now if we compare this to what we wanted, but um, what we want is the sum of uh, the temperature polynomials at the nodes times the weights should be equal to pi if k equals zero, and then zero otherwise. So this part we got. We just need to scale it to get this. So, so what that means is if we set the weights equal to the same value, pi over n, 
So to cancel with the n and get a, a result of pi, OK, so to have a qu Gauss quadrature rule on minus one to one with a given weight function, the nodes are the Chebyshev points, and these are the weights. So that's what works as a Gauss quadrature rule, and it's exact for all polynomials up to degree two and minus one. So questions about what happened here? Yeah, that would have been a fun problem for y'all to do. <laughs> Not. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. This kind of situation of uh, this using kind of trigger identities to evaluate something like this, I've seen it happen in other places too. Like, I, I saw this talk at a MAA meeting about uh, um, the sum of uh, 1 over n squared. Because like in calculus, you learn that that, that series converges, uh, but not what its value is. It's pi squared over six. Um, and uh, there's different approaches to showing that the sum is pi squared over six. And uh, doing some Krig magic like this is uh, one of those approaches. Yeah. <clears throat> so it comes up now and then. So um, who knows? You know, why you're here, you might get assigned to teach. Math 103, which is trig, although actually none of the grad students really like doing that. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I, I've noticed that trig seems to be a weak spot. It's kind of funny, like most students, algebra, they just can't do algebra. You all could do algebra because you know you're teaching it. Um, but there's something about trig. It's just it's never blind spot. <clears throat> it was it like was my like favorite a class in high school, and I've forgotten oh. all of it. But That's it was. Right. So yeah. fun when it was just like its own subject. Yeah. I th it's just easy to forget when you pull it into everything else later. Yeah. I don't know. Well, the problem is like in, in calculus too, you do see a lot of trig. But after that, perhaps not so much. And um, you know, I, I end up needing it often enough that it, it sticks with me. But um, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it takes. It's just using all this stuff all the time. Um, and the trig doesn't really happen. Okay. Um, all right. So hopefully I can fit this in the remaining remaining time. Um, yeah. So now with convergence, a Newton Coates rule with n nodes. Um, uh, Does uh, okay, so I should say an approximate integral based on a Newton Coates rule of n nodes does not necessarily converge to the exact integral as n goes to infinity. What about a Gauss rule? Let's see what happens then. Um, so this is from exploration nine, seven, uh, six. Um, Okay. Um, right. So we want to show um, that. Um, okay, I need to state my assumptions here. If Q n of f is the uh, n node 
Gauss quadrature approximation of the exact integral which I'll call I of F show that the limits whoops this goes to infinity of Q N of F is equal to I of F. All right. Now we're going to, going to get this a tad bit real analysis -y on you. That's um, a sequence a n uh, converges to limit l as n goes to infinity. If um, okay, or all epsilon zero, or is this a natural number and not? Uh, such that for and greater equal to n naught, um, a n minus l is less than epsilon. Okay. So we're going to use that uh, to help us here. Um, so really, I want to look at the absolute value of q n of f when I'm taking a limit of minus i of f. Um, so I'm going to break this error. So, because so, this, so, so Q N of F minus I of F, that's the error. And I want to show that the error goes to zero. What is uh, that? that? In space be approaching again? I'm behind I'm behind. Right. After the, on the first line of the recall, you have in approaches if. Oh, oh, whoops, yeah. Um, got a water. Infinity. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, I guess that makes sense since you had it there. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't like, I don't know, something else. <laughs> okay, well, you never know. Um, actually, the limit itself, I'm going to rewrite. I can say QNF minus IF limit goes to zero. All right, because that's what we're going to be working with. Okay, and it's the same thing, but. OK, so I'm showing the error goes to zero. Um, so I'm going to break this error down into three parts. Um, yeah. So um, using some add subtract right here, QN minus F. Minus um, oh wait I shoot I can't do that yet um er hold on so I need to use a theorem here I need to do this first. Wire stress approximation theorem. Or states that for any epsilon, there exists a polynomial um, uh, P such that. Um, on the interval a b f x minus p of x is less than epsilon. Um, so you may have to go to a very high degree, but there is such a polynomial that'll get as, as close to f as you want um, on a uh, close interval. 
Um, and I need to be a little more rigorous here. You just assume uh, F is continuous on the interval A, B in which we're integrating. Okay. And for the Weierstrass theorem to apply. Okay. Um, so now, Okay, so I'm going to let epsilon uh, greater than zero. Um, and I'm going to let P of X um, be a polynomial that um, Let me make sure I get this right. Um, all right. That approximates F with this error. And I'm not going to use epsilon, though. I'm going to use. Epsilon over 2w where w is the sum of all the weights of uh, Gauss quadrature rule, except the Gauss quadrature nodes and weights depend on n, but um okay i just forgive you doing this in the fly it's sloppy this is some of the absolute value of the weights but here's the key here gauss quadrature weights are guaranteed positive so i can just drop the absolute value so now what i really have is a sum of the weights can anyone tell me what the sum of the weights of a Gauss of not not just a Gauss quadrature rule, any quadrature rule should be? If we're integrating on interval A B. <clears throat> Whatever. Whatever the between, Between that, that and B is? B minus A. All right. so, so, uh, so that's what capital W is. So yes, yeah, so some of the weights of the Gauss quadrature rule is always B minus A. OK, but uh, for convenience, I'll just abbreviate it as W. So yeah, for like you said, the width of the interval. Um, or you said distance, didn't you? But same thing. OK, <laughs> all right, great. Now. Um, So now I'm in a position to break the error down into three parts. So QN of F minus I of F is equal to, all right, so I'll do a QN of F minus QN of P. And then I have to add that back in. Okay. Um, minus I of P plus I of P, so the exact integral of that polynomial, minus I of F. Now, triangle inequality. I can um, break these into pieces as long as I use less than or equal to.
plus M and Q and the P. That's IP. And then this last part, IP. Minus I that. Okay. <clears throat> now, the integral is linear. So the integral of P minus the integral of F, that's the same as the integral of P minus F. The quadrant rule, also linear. So a quadrant rule applied to F minus a quadrant rule applied to P is the same as quadrant rule applied to F minus P. Now, um, now, if n is sufficiently large, um, okay, well, actually, yeah, p is a polynomial of some degree. We don't know about the, what a degree is, but the point is it's some fixed degree that depends on this epsilon. So for epsilon I've chosen, once I find the P that is close enough to F, N is going off to infinity. So the second part of the error Zero. Because P is a polynomial. Um, and this gauss quadrature rule is exact for all polynomials of uh, whatever N is, degree two and minus one. So this is a polynomial of some fixed degree. So for any epsilon, there's some threshold N at which this quadrature rule becomes exact for this polynomial. And it will remain exact for all greater n off going, going off to infinity. So we can discard, as long as n is large enough, we can discard the, this error altogether. So now what do we have? Well, f minus p is at most epsilon. So here we have a function that's at most epsilon, um, or I should say, no, not epsilon, epsilon over 2w. And then we're multiplying it by the weights and adding them up. So this part of the error So most epsilon over two, um, or really it's epsilon over two W times W, um, because that's because we're multiplying by the weights and adding them up. And over here, P minus F is a function that of size at most epsilon. We're integrating that function, uh, oh sorry, yeah, dang it. P minus F is at most epsilon over 2w, not epsilon by itself. But we're integrating over the interval ab, which is of width w. So that also is multiplied by w. So then we simplify all this. Oh, it should be strictly. Um, OK. Yeah, I, I could say that this is strictly less than now. And that's epsilon. So for any epsilon that I choose, there exists some n, as long as it's sufficiently large, that the error 
will be less than epsilon. It'll remain less than epsilon as n goes off to infinity. So by the definition of a limit of a sequence, um, this expression is going to zero. <clears throat> All right, so all right, so to, to, to recap why this worked, um, because you can find a polynomial that ag agrees with f up to whatever error threshold you chose. And I'm sorry I kept saying epsilon, it's epsilon over 2w, because I wanted to contrive this whole thing to become epsilon, as real analysis textbooks always do. Um, so I can, so P by Weierstrass approximation theorem approximates F to this level of error. Then when I'm, uh, so when I have a function as the most epsilon, um, and I plug it into a quadrature rule such as this, these values are at most Okay, epsilon over 2w. I apologize, but I continue screwing that up. Um, it's my, so whatever approximation p gives me, that's what's filled in here as an upper bound for that. And what's left? You're multiplying by the sum of a weights in absolute value, which is w. Um, so that applies to this part of the error this part of the error. So this difference is at most epsilon over 2w. Sorry, I just wanted to say it right for once in my life. Um, and then whether it's the quadrature rule or the true integral, um, both the approximation and the exact integral will simply multiply that upper bound by w. And then because the approximation p is a polynomial, um, and Gauss quadrature rules are exact for polynomials up to a certain degree. Once n is large enough, this will be exact, so that part of the error becomes zero, and we can bound the overall error uh, by whatever we wish, by, by any epsilon we choose. Um, so because it always works, because there's always an n that works as long as it's large enough, um, we can make the error arbitrarily small, therefore it's going to zero. <clears throat> Questions about what happened here? So hopefully this is related to something that when I see it dealt with in one of your real analysis classes, <laughs> whether it's 541 or 641. Uh, um, I don't even know what you all are covering in there, but <laughs> um, actually, has has Weierstrass come up in either of those classes? Oh. Not that I can think of. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much real analysis out there to cover. Now, one very important point to make here is I mentioned at the very beginning of this part that while this works for a Gauss rule, it does not work for a Newton Coates rule. And here's why it's this line right here. Um, so um, the sum of a weights. For any interpolatory rule, is going to be b minus a. The problem is with the uh, Newton Coates rule, um, when I bound these parts of the error, I have to multiply by w, which is the sum of the absolute values of the weights. And for a Newton Coates rule, once n gets large enough, you're going to have some negative weights. 
So if these two are not equal, um, and while the sum of the absolute values of the weights for a Gauss rule is equal to b minus a, no matter what n is, because of negative weights, as n goes off to infinity, while this will always be equal to b minus a, this sum could conceivably be unbounded because you're adding up all these positive and negative weights. Um, so I'll just make that point here. Um, This proof does not work for Newton Coast rules because um, the sum of the absolute value of the weights is not necessarily equal to uh, B minus A. Uh, if we knew that the sum of the absolute value of the weights could at least be bounded by something that's independent of N, um, then uh, that this could be made to work, but we don't have that. We don't, we don't know that. Um, so, so this is, uh, again, I've pointed out that you know, Gauss quadrature, most people like it because it has a high degree of accuracy, but I really think that uh, you know, what, what should not be lost on, on, on this is, uh, uh, what should not be lost on this is the fact that it's so robust, it's so stable because of a guarantee of positive weights, that if you use a whole bunch of nodes, then at least you know that that error really is going to be smaller um, as uh, the number of nodes keeps increasing. And uh, uh, some researchers have used uh, Gauss node, Gauss uh, watcher with like a very large number of nodes. Um, and at least it's something they can trust, where if they're doing the same thing of Newton Coates, a whole lot easier to code up um, because you can get the nodes and weights, the nodes at least very easily, but um, it just, uh, um, but then you can't really trust the approximate integral that you're getting in that case. Okay. Um, so this uh, is all I have to say about uh, Gauss quadrature. Um, so all that's left is. For y'all to finish the dang homework, or as much of it as you can. Um, <laughs> wow, it's dark there. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is. I just love how much it changes drastically from four o'clock to five o'clock. <laughs> this is it's like you're doing math from a cave, like you're in hiding or something. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, um, alrighty. Um, so, um, at least you, know, you, have, you have a few weeks or so um, to uh, get done what you can, and uh, and I'm I'm sure I'll hear from you all uh, about uh, how it's going. Um, and yeah, this is, it's kind of sad that this is the last time we're meeting, um, but uh, it's also next semester to look forward to. Um, <laughs> but we'll take an even deeper dive into certain things. So. All right. Um, so, good luck with all the things. <laughs> Those that come from me, and and also the ones that don't, like ODEs or real analysis or um, whatever else it is you're you're putting up with. Um, so, all right. Um, so, uh, just uh, let me know how things are going, and I'll get around to. Grading your homework soon, but I mean, you all doing a great job. I'm so I'm sure that everybody will be fine. Um, and yes, it'll be painful, but we'll get through it. <laughs> okay. Any last questions about anything? Or could I ask could I one ask? quick homework question? I have five minutes, so yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. So. For 9.2.3, and I think it's, as when I was talking to you about this morning, it's where you combine the um, the poly definite integral function with the Lagrange function. Yeah. Um, right now, I'm getting one weight. 
as a result, or hopefully it, it might not even, it could be by luck, but it is computing out one of my weights. Um, this could just chalk up to me being not a great coder, but um, the length function in MATLAB, it takes the greatest value in the array, correct? Oh, okay, the length function is meant to work equally well for row or column vector. So whatever dimension is the largest is what it'll, what it'll take. So yeah, so, so that way, if you give it a row or a column vector, it'll tell you the number of elements in it. Wait, it tells you the number of elements in the row or? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, so because okay. it's a vector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll tell you how many elements are in the vector. Okay, so I guess my length is having nothing to do with it. I was trying to mess around with quite a few things, but yeah, I'm getting like one weight. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so it's only computing one weight? Even one though weight, uh, yeah, and, and the thing is, is like, I've tried messing around and trying to figure out how to display it differently. Um, so maybe I'll just have to mess around with it more. Okay. Um, yeah, because since what you're doing is you're getting each weight by integrating some Lagrange polynomial, right? Right. Okay. Um, and like you have a loop that's going through the Lagrange polynomials and mm -hmm. like, yeah, so um, yeah, that's weird that you're getting just one weight. I mean, it, again, it's probably, it's definitely a me thing, but I, okay. yeah, I have it running through the, um, or I have some of the code from Lagrange and some of it from yeah. the other, uh, it's just, it's just uh, I didn't, I don't know if it's a. Okay, I, I'm going to throw out a hunch. Um, what happens often, just because it's kind of a mistake I see students often make. Uh, where we're supposed to store, be storing things in a vector. So you, you compute each weight, and you're supposed to store that in a vector in one element of a vector. So like if, if, it's, if you know, W is your final vector of weights, you definitely do not want to say W equals something. Right. Well, and well, I right, the vector. So if you say W parentheses i equals something, then you're setting one element of the vector. So you have to take into account what kind of object you're dealing with. Um, so that would be one way to end up doing all the correct computation but still only having one weight. Right. I, earlier I had like the w parentheses um, colon. Uh, I did it colon colon j, but are you saying to do W of I? Yeah, because you don't need a colon in this case because W is a vector, so you just need one index. Uh, when it's a matrix, you'll have you know, row, comma, column indices. And like it, it, colon is used if you're like setting an entire row or entire column of a matrix equal to something, but that's not what's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're setting the W1 equal to your first weight, W2 equal to your second, and so forth. Right. right. Uh, um so is this that would be my hunch as to what's going on here it, it, that um that you're just overriding each with a, in the latest weight each time oh i probably am doing that because it would be oh i didn't know if it was showing my first or last weight but because oh, yeah. they're the same in my case but oh, simpson's rule yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that was the next thing I was going to ask. Is it the last weight? And then I realized, oh, yeah, that wouldn't tell I you. Wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I knew it was the first or the last <laughs> weight. So okay. I was kind of going off of, I was actually trying to go off of it, imagining it's the first weight. But really what I'm doing is overriding the other two weights somehow. Uh, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, second overrides the first, and third overrides the second. So, yeah. Okay, I'll try to figure that out. Thank That's you. Perfect, like, how could something like that happen? Oh, here's how. And yes, I do see students do that all the time. <laughs> so. Great. Um, well, at least <laughs> it's a more common thing than a. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, it, storage is a big problem, it seems. Um, so it's, 
maybe it's something I need to spend more time on. But yeah. You know. <sighs> so. Okay. Uh, oh, we're at five fifteen now, and Chelsea has to go to class, <laughs> to teach class. <laughs> so, alrighty. Yeah. Thank you. Yep.